Yeah, so thank you for organising this conference uh, and thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been really interesting so far. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about uh, exotic objects today, which is the name I'm giving to these in-between objects that people have, have talked about a little bit um, today. So things that are between the abstract and the concrete. And I'm going to use mathematical objects as kind of a case study to, to illustrate this idea. Um, so this is, this is what I'll go through. Um, we've talked a lot about the abstract concrete distinction today, so I'll, I'll go over that briefly. Um, and part of what um, common definitions of concrete seem to include is that something exists in space, but it's not always clear what we mean by that. Um, so I'll talk about um, what that means a little bit. And I'll reinforce um, that by discussing why it is that we take purported abstract objects to be non-spatial. Um, then I'll start asking whether or not we've ever actually thought the abstract concrete distinction is exhaustive. Um, in terms of some examples and just in terms of sort of the general philosophical literature. Um, and then I'll talk about these exotic objects, this framework that we should use to talk about these in between objects. And I'll illustrate that with mathematical objects and then kind of finish off with just some general uh, advantages of the account. Um, so yeah, cool. Um, so the abstract concrete distinction. Um, so I'm conceiving of it in, in terms of the way of negation. I think it, as I said, it's fairly standard. So concrete objects exist in space, exist in time, and causally interact with the world. Abstract objects do none of those things. Um, we typically take it that this distinction is exhaustive. Um, but when we say that concrete objects exist in space, I think we mean something really specific by that. Um, and what I think we mean is something along um, these lines. Um, so these are maybe some suggested criteria for what it is to be spatial. So we say that something is spatial if it, you know, has a definite location, you know, we can go out and find it. Um, if it occupies a volume, you know, if it's got a size in that sense, if it takes up space. And if it has definite boundaries, you know, maybe we can perhaps me measure, measure those boundaries. Um, if something does all those things or does some of those things, that's what it takes for them to, something to be spatial. And I think the core of that is that we can ask... Uh, well, it makes sense to ask and answer questions of the form, you know, where is it now and how much space does it occupy? I think if we can do that, then it makes sense to say that thing is spatial. Um, so why is it that we take abstract objects to be non-spatial? Well, ultimately, I think it's because they fail to do one of those three things just mentioned. Um, so talking in terms of platonic mathematical objects, it doesn't make sense to talk about platonic mathematical objects occupying a volume or having boundaries or a definite spatial location. And so ultimately, because they fail to do those things we've just mentioned, um, we take them to be uh, non-spatial and so non-concrete. Uh, and certain conceptions of things like fictional objects, um, universals, things like this. Also, for similar reasons, I think we say that these things aren't spatial and so that these things aren't concrete. Um, because we take the distinction to be exhaustive, we then say that um, these things have to be abstract. Um, okay, um, but is it legitimate to do that? Is it legitimate to make that inference to, well, it can't be concrete, so it must be abstract? Well, I'm not, I'm not so sure. So if that boundary point that I mentioned is what it takes for an object to be spatial, and then it turns out quite a lot of objects aren't going to be spatial. So we've got really vague objects like mountains and piles of sand on the beach. They don't have a definite boundary in the sense that we might be looking for. Um, but even more than that, ordinary objects at the molecular level, um, we kind of zoom in and all we'll really see is a cloud of particles. Um, and it's, it's not that we see a definite boundary between the tables and the chairs. It's just instead that there's just this mass of, this mass of molecules. Um, and we can't really tell what belongs to what object. So I won't read it out, but there's a quote, quote from Varsi that are talking about this kind of idea that boundaries maybe isn't what we should be looking for. Um, but even at the atomic level, you might think that atoms don't have a definite boundary in similar ways. So uh, the nature of electrons is such that, well, as far as we know, um, they exist as orbitals. So there's kind of like a probabilistic banding where we can say, well, the electron might be found this far from the atom. It might be found a little bit further. Um, but in the same sense as how mountains and things like that don't necessarily have a definite end, um, things like atoms might not have a definite boundary. Um, so, okay, we well, might say, well, that's fine. Maybe boundary 
isn't what it takes to be spatial, isn't what it takes to be concrete, but at least we can say that the parts of molecules and things like that have a definite location in space, and that's what matters. Well, unfortunately, that's just not the case, right? So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that if we're measuring the velocity of an electron, for example, uh, it simply isn't true to say that it's got a definite location in space. And think of the weird phenomena of quantum physics like superposition, these really bring into doubt that these objects exist in space in the, in the way that we, we normally think of things existing in space. Um, so that's that's the boundary point, that's the, the location point. What about volume? Might we just say, well, okay, boundaries are weird, definite locations are weird, but at least everything takes up an amount of space, so it exists in space. Well, equally, that's maybe not true. So quarks and electrons and things like that are said to be point particles. So they uh, occupy zero, zero volume in and of themselves. They don't take up an amount of space in that sense. So it seems like for, broad, for broadly similar reasons to the reasons that we say, you know, for example, platonic mathematical objects are non-spatial, we can kind of say some of the objects of physics maybe are non-spatial in the same sense. And then if that requires, um, if spatiality is required for concreteness, maybe we can say some of the objects of physics aren't concrete. Um, you might be really unpersuaded and think this is a bit weird. It is a little bit weird. Um, I won't read them all out, but here's a couple of quotes maybe to start persuading you. So there's the Matthias Egg one at the bottom left. Uh, the particles of fundamental physics, in fact, have so little in common with ordinary objects that it becomes doubtful to even place them in the same category. You know, we standardly think ordinary objects, every, everyday stuff is concrete. Why do we assume that about the stuff of fundamental physics? It's really weird. It's got strange properties. Why well, think that it's concrete as well? And the quote from Heisenberg on the right, I'll read out. Um, According to Democritus, atoms had lost the qualities like color, taste, etc. They only occupied space. But in modern physics, atoms lose this last property. They possess geometrical qualities in no higher degree than color, taste, etc. What I think this means is that some of the objects of physics just fail to be spatial. Uh, and because of that, in the right sense, and because of that, they fail to be concrete. But we've been saying maybe the abstract concrete distinction is exhaustive. So does that mean I think the objects of physics are abstract objects? Um, no, um, because I'm not sure we've ever actually thought the abstract concrete distinction was exhaustive. Um, and I think we can show that just, just by looking at the philosophical literature. So it really depends who you ask uh, in terms of whether or not the distinction is exhaustive. So you'll often get um, things posited and described in the literature. So Valentina just talked about Parsons and his quasi-concrete objects. This is a really good example of this kind of thing. And I did have that on an earlier draft of this slide, but I removed it. Um, but you get things like epiphenomenal minds described. Um, they exist in space and time, but they're said to be acausal. Well, that's not clear that it's an abstract, it's not clear that it's a concrete object. It's not clear that it's an abstract object. You get certain conceptions of Aristotelian universals, nation states, and again, so we mentioned Williamson uh, earlier on in the day. Um, Williamson's contingently non-concrete entities don't seem to neatly fit in as abstract and concrete. Um, a lot of people talk about these in-between objects, and a lot of people sometimes talk about them vaguely, like Parsons says things are quasi-concrete, other people say quasi-abstract, all these kind of this kind of terminology. And I think this just shows that, and so at the bottom there is, is my view of mathematical objects, which we'll get onto. So I think mathematical objects fail to exist in space and time, but that they can cause things to happen. We'll get onto that later. But I just think this shows that things can fail to be concrete without being abstract. And we've kind of always accepted um, this in-between ground, uh, which leads us on to my idea. So this framework of exotic objects. So we've taken the distinction between abstract and concrete to be exhaustive, but we've got these weird cases from science, which don't seem to be spatial in the right sense. And so they don't seem to be concrete in the right sense. And we've got all these examples from the philosophical literature, um, which don't seem to neatly fit into the abstract concrete distinction. Um, so we need to talk about this in between, in between category. So to do that, let's let's consider for a minute these characteristics we've been talking about of being spatial, being temporal, and being causal. Let's consider them as things that can be possessed independently um, or act independently um, by objects. Well, if we do that, then there's going to be a whole spectrum of objects between the abstract and the concrete. And that's what I'm talking about when I say exotic objects. So here's what this looks like. 
Um, so you've got the characteristics at the top uh, and the object kind on the left. Um, it's a one if the object kind exhibits that characteristic, it's a zero if it doesn't. You can see we've got this whole spectrum of possible um, object kinds between the abstract and concrete. Um, now, I, I, I'll emphasize two things. Uh, the first, this is a work in progress, so this is by no means finished. Um, uh, there's definitely going to be more columns and rows to add to this, but this is kind of just a start of categorizing these things. Um, and I also want to say I'm not committed to um, the existence of an example for each of these rows. So, um, for example, I don't believe epiphenomenal minds exist, but I believe how epiphenomenal minds are described in the literature is as an exotic object rather than a concrete or abstract object. Um, and you can see where some of the other examples I've talked about might fit on this scale. Um, and that's the general idea, really, of exotic objects. Um, these in-between objects, which maybe possess these characteristics in different degrees and different arrangements, and this allows for this kind of variation in object kinds. So let, let's move on to the case study for math, math, mathematical objects. Um, so I've said that mathematical objects might be non-spatial temporal but causal, and that might sound a little bit weird. You might be thinking, well, how, how is that? How can that be the case? Well, math, math, mathematical objects are causal in virtue of constraining the way the world is and the way the world can be. So the classic example that a lot of people discuss at Lang, for example, um, is that the reason that 23 strawberries cannot be divided equally between three children is because 23 is indivisible by three. Um, there's this counterfactual dependence of the, um, from the mathematical fact to the physical fact in the world, the impossibility of certain actions. You know, had mathematics been different, then, you know, we probably would have been able to divide the strawberries like that. That's the sense of um, causation I'm talking about. And I'll go into this a little bit more detail. So I'm going to look, I'll probably go through the next few slides, maybe a little bit quickly, um, but I'm happy to talk more about them in Q&A, um, but that, that's, that's up to people if people want to discuss it more. Um, so this counterfactual dependence, I think we can show that that suffices for causation by talking about structural equation models and the interventionist approach to causation. So structural equation models, you kind of build these maps up of diagrams um, and kind of play around with the variables. So we've got the classic example of Susie throws the rock and the window smashes. For an interventionist about causation, that it's true to say that Susie's rock caused Susie's throwing of the rock caused the window to smash. If you know, maybe we recreated the scenario and manipulated it such that Susie didn't throw the rock and the window wouldn't smash. We do these kind of interventions and we can start to see these counterfactual dependencies, and then that suffices for causation. Um, and we can use these to model grounding relationships and all sort of interesting dependence relationships in philosophy. Um, and we can model quite complex ones. Um, so we can model these cases uh, where there seems to be multiple streams of interacting counterfactual dependence that maybe supersede each other in di uh, different scenarios. Um, so like this one, again, I won't go into the details of this because uh, it's quite boring, but um, I'm happy to talk about that more um, in the Q&A. Um, and we can also model these constraint relationships. Now, this is the one, the one I'll go into a little bit of detail on. So let's imagine we've got um, there's a river flowing down a mountain. And there's two paths the river can take, two distributaries. Um, for whatever reason, the river flows down distributary B. Um, it's just the way it goes. Uh, until one day when a tree falls and the tree blocks off distributary B. So it makes it impossible for water to flow down distributary B. Now, as a result of the fact that it's impossible for water to flow down distributary B, and as a result that distributary A is open, water ends up flowing down distributary A. Um, now, there's a counterfactual dependence there from the tree falling to the water flowing down distributary A. And that's that. So that, that red line there is what I'm interested in, this transitive causation of the tree falling to the to the water flowing. And we can show that's causal by using these diagrams, uh, using interventionist approaches to causation, um, you know, perform interventions on this model. And it just it, it comes out that that's a causal relationship. Um, so I've got I've got a paper about this, which people are welcome to read if, if they're ever really bored and want to. Um, but the structure of this relationship, so this count this counterfactual dependence, which seems to be causation, is mirrored in the mathematical case, right? So the mathematical fact that 23 is indivisible by three makes it impossible for 23 objects to divide evenly into three groups. Um, and as a result of that, and as a result of the fact that, say, um, some arbitrary uh, 
uh, division is possible, the strawberries ended up getting divided in some arbitrary way. There's the same kind of counterfactual dependence uh, in this case. Um, same, same structure, same counterfactual dependence of Zx upon x. Um, so of the physical facts upon the mathematical facts. Well, what does this mean? Well, the tree case is causal in virtue of constraining. Um, that's a tree. It's, it's correct to say that the tree caused the water to flow the way it did, and it did so by constraining the available options. And we can show that by using these structural equation models and interventionist interpretations, along with other counterfactual interpretations as well, uh, and possibly some probabilistic ones, actually. Um, but the strawberries case has exactly the same structure, right? And it behaves in exactly the same way under interventions. So if the tree case is causal, then so too is the mathematics case, and so mathematical objects are causal. And because, so then we, we can see that the, the table I, I, I had up earlier, so mathematical objects can be non-spatial, temporal, but causal, that doesn't seem concrete, doesn't seem abstract, in fact seems like they might be this middle kind of object. Um, you might be wondering why this is a better view of mathematical objects than some of the other ones out there. Well, I think there's some advantages to it. So you might be asking, well, why think that mathematical objects specifically or in particular are in fact exotic objects? You know, you might say something like mathematical objects are paradigm abstract objects. Um, we've defined the concept of abstractness in some cases around mathematical objects. So are we not just getting something wrong if we say that mathematical objects are in fact not abstract, they're something else? Well, no, I don't think we are. So mathematical objects were presumably introduced in order to play some sort of explanatory role in order to do something for our theories, right? And I just don't think they can do that as traditional platonic objects. Um, I think my explanation of them being exotic better fits the role they were introduced in order to play. Um, it's admittedly a strange result, but it doesn't matter if initially, you know, we defined the entire notion of abstractness around them. We were just wrong to do that because they were in fact always exotic. Um, and there's another reason to do this, um, because we can avoid some classic problems with mathematical Platonism if we say that mathematical objects are exotic. So we've got these makes no difference style objections, and we've got these Banasarov challenges, which kind of crucially depend on the a-causality of mathematics, which is just something I'm denying, right? So, and in denying that, I kind of dodge these important challenges. So Platonism, you know, it's often said it's got the indispensability arguments, which again, we've discussed today. Um, in, in its favor, you know, we have to believe in mathematical objects. Well, that's great, but that doesn't answer these kind of questions about the sort of the inherent mysteriousness of mathematical objects. And it doesn't really tell us anything about what, what math, mathematical objects are. And that's what my theory hopefully does a little bit of. So I think the Platonists should maybe be a little bit happier with my theory because, you know, I can dodge these problems and I kind of get rid of a little bit of that inherent mystery by saying what kind of object mathematical objects are. Um, equally, the nominalist, um, if they're not happier with my theory than Platonism, they at least have to come up with some new objections um, to it because I can dodge the sort of the classic ones that are getting thrown at Platonism. And that's the end of, I guess, the case study of mathematical objects. I know that was a little bit quick. Um, so you might say, well, okay, that's fine. Um, and you don't need to be convinced by that account. That was just, just an illustration of it. Um, but you might say, well, why, why believe there are these exotic objects? Um, because again, I think there's kind of advantages to doing that. Um, in some parts of metaphysics, we already believe there's these in-between objects. You know, we've talked about them today. A lot of people talk about them in the literature. Um, so why stick with the abstract concrete distinction as being exhaustive? If it just doesn't seem to work, it doesn't seem to account for a lot of the things we talk about. Now, one, one thing you might be thinking is, well, rather than radically introduce this new category of object, why don't we just maybe re redefine uh, concreteness or redefine abstractness so we can, for example, capture quarks as being concrete, but capture some other things as being abstract? Well, you can do that. Um, I think in doing that, you're probably going to capture some metaphysically weird entities as being concrete, and that's going to maybe seem the wrong, wrong result. And I think the better result is just to go, you know, Maybe some of the objects of science, like quarks, for example, turn out to be non-concrete. Maybe that's a little bit strange, but um, that's not a bad result. And I don't think that shows it's wrong. I just think that's quite interesting. Um, so I think we should just accept there's this new sort of in-between category. Um, and that's, I guess, kind of where I want to leave it today, really. I, it was kind of a brief introduction to the idea. Um, but what should we do now? Well, I think we should ditch the abstract concrete distinction. Um, and I think we should, or at least ditch the idea of it being exhaustive. Um, 
and we should we should kind of start going for this new framework these exotic objects talk about these in-between objects and we should kind of undertake this project to categorize the different kinds of exotic objects and then in that sense develop a periodic table of objects as it were because you know it seems like we have to talk about objects and we need to do it in a more systematic way there's something a little bit unsatisfying when people kind of beat around the bush and don't say exactly what type of object they're talking about um in some cases um and i think the way to kind of solve that is just to be really explicit and systematic and have this framework to talk about these in-between objects and that's just exactly what this account aims to do uh, as i say it is a work in progress but i think you know maybe it's, it's a good start to, to doing that um so yeah thank you for listening um and yeah that's the, the bibliography if anyone wants to to see yeah thank you samuel um are there any questions uh-huh Hashur, please Okay, thank you for your talk. Uh, you rightly, I think, put your put the mathematical objects um, in a non-temporal um, in the non-temporal column. So, by putting them in non-temporal column, you kind of weakened um, the the idea that they can be causal. So, your explanation, your counterfactual explanation regarding trees and so on are all explanations that happening in a timed framework this is one point another point is that like the strawberry example you can just instead of saying that it caused it because like the because there was referring to an explanation like that was a mathematical explanation not a causal relation i guess yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this this is a big a big problem to tackle. Um, uh, yeah, so I think so. The because as being an explanation, I guess I am quite convinced by Lang's talk about constraint. So um, yeah, I, I think I, I did find that quite convincing, and the way he talks about that as maybe being so. Um, Karen Bennett's building relations. I'm kind of tempted to think maybe constraint is something more than just an explanation. Maybe it's maybe it's um, a building relation of some kind. And I think maybe causation is, is plausible. Um, as to the temporality, um, yeah. So it so it is a problem. I think with the tree case inherently happening in time, um, that does in a sense make it a weaker example. But I think what I try to get at in the paper or talk about that is that the fact it ha happens across time isn't necessarily you know in an important feature of the causal relation in that case it seems like the causal relation or it seems like the important relation is that you know this possibility has been shut off as an as a result something else happens we can kind of show this um is causal via an interventionist interpretation it's a very weak notion of causation i accept that um, but yeah, so I kind of try and emphasize that maybe the temporality is not that important. So it is present, but it's not crucial. So the fact it's not present in the mathematics case, maybe it's not a problem, but it's definitely something I need to do some work on. So thank you. Okay, and Andrea? Uh, I, I have also a problem with the tree case and uh, the divisible by three case, uh, because I think there's an, uh, uh, an, an essential distinction between these two kinds of cases, uh, which kind of removes the parallel that uh, you rely upon, uh, because say the tree hasn't fallen yet, then it's possible that he will, uh, that it will fall. Um, so it's a contingent fact that he hasn't, uh, that it hasn't fallen. Um, and it's not a contingent fact that a strawberry, uh, that 23 isn't divisible by three it's a necessary fact that this is not the case. So um, of course you can assume that in, in a counterfactual scenario, for example, that this tree uh, uh, were uh, fall uh, and that's not, not a problem, but you cannot assume that uh, 23 is divisible by three uh, because that's not possible. So it doesn't make uh, this your, uh, the, the parallel you rely upon, um, but that doesn't this destroy the parallel uh, between these two cases? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, I didn't have time to, to get into that. So today in, in the presentation, but um, yeah, so I do kind of rely on counter possibles being kind of non-trivial and, you know, maybe 
counterfactual dependence sometimes being explainable in terms of counter possibles. Um, and that is a big, a big assumption of the theory, right? Um, and I'm kind of working on arguing um, that that's maybe just fine. And it, it does, maybe it seems really big to us and it seems to destroy the analogy. Um, I'm trying to do work to say maybe it is just a, a, a really big difference in degree, but not a difference in kind. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's something I need to work on more. But mm -hmm. that, that's kind of the, the, the way I'm going with that at the minute. Um, 